Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Palumbo podcast, where we interview some of the most successful entrepreneurs to learn about how they got to the top. Today, we have with us Chuck Garcia. Chuck Garcia was at Bloomberg. He was the 190th employee at Bloomberg. He was there for 14 years in various leadership roles. And then BlackRock Citadel and started his own business in 2013, which is called Climb to the Top or Climb Leadership. And currently coaches within his business, uh, executives and teaching them to, to really climb, continue to climb to the top. So, so Chuck, thank you so much for today. Really appreciate it. And looking forward to, to learning a lot about you. Well, thank you for having me on, Phil. It's, it's a pleasure. And I'm, yeah. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to your cast. Thank you very much. It's always been awesome talking to you, Chuck. Ah, so, same. Um, so I want to start off with Chuck, the, the mindset, right? So you've had various leadership positions. You're currently coaching, et cetera. You've had a great career. Mm-hmm. And what has been the mindset when you were younger that you think helped you to get to where you are today? Yeah, and I'm glad you opened with that because I think as we went through our conventional educations as kids, nobody taught us about mindset. They taught us that school is something that rewards you for what you know and then penalizes you for what you don't. So if ever you don't know anything, we walk around as a kid thinking, I must be stupid because I don't know. But I'm fortunate that I grew up, uh, I grew up in West Point at the United States Military Academy. My dad was a professor of linguistics there. He was a civilian professor in a military installation. My dad was the best teacher I ever had, because even though we went to school, cramming, examining, regurgitating, do what you can, get into the right school, blah, blah, blah. My father really opened my eyes to not being held captive by what you know, but really never stop being curious about what you don't. And you use that curiosity to explore how you are going to step up and take your place in the world. He wasn't held dogma by any particular person or profession of what he wanted for me. The mindset that my parents taught me was very much about finding my way. And they were there and I'm grateful. They provided so much support. And even though from the time I was a little kid, I wanted to go to Wall Street, my parents didn't know what that meant. They had come from the from Brazil the year before I was born. My right. dad was an right. academic. They, they didn't know that stuff, but but I always gravitated to it. So the mindset that I tried to give to my own children always helped them to support the curiosity as a means of following your path, not anyone else's, the path for you. And it can be found if you just keep your mind open to the endless possibilities. Wow, that's really terrific. So how did you take that and, and bring it to the level that you have throughout life? So how did you take that mind of being curious? Like, how did yeah. you use that as a tool? Yeah, well, I, unfortunately, I got a, a little bit away from that because when I went to college, I went to Syracuse as a finance major. I had one goal. All I ever wanted to do was go into the world of, of financial services. I had no other ambition or interest. And as you know, Phil, what happens when you start getting into the world, in fact, I'm going to hold up a book that is near and dear to my heart that I've read a zillion times. But when you become a finance major, an accounting major, whatever whatever your path is to finance, it's very much rooted in what you need to put in your head so that you are knowledgeable to build your credibility, your trust, and the respect that people have for you. So I was very much rooted early on in my career. What do I need to know in order to be good at what I do. And I was really focused on what is the professional development necessary for me to build that credibility, trust, and respect. And that came from learning the investment field that ultimately led me to Bloomberg. But but the beauty of it, Phil, and I guess I was blessed in that I joined Bloomberg when it was a very small company. And Everything I thought about how to succeed by just doing what you're told and then give 10% more was completely flipped upside down when I got there. When you're working for a small company and, and the job that you have could entail 100 things in a day, if you're the kind of person that only stays in your lane and sticks to the two or three things that you do well, 
you're not sufficiently adaptable to the culture or the organization who actually expects and demands you to be adaptable to be able to do a whole lot of things. The reason I say that, Phil, what being in a great company early on teaches you is that's when I began to bring the curiosity of there's no job description out there for for the future. I learned to create my own job descriptions at that organization. And that was born out of the curiosity that there's no prescribed path when you're in an entrepreneurial environment, but nobody's going to make it for you. You make your path, you propose it, and then you do it. And that's, I think, my, my ascent was not based on waiting back and finding out what are the jobs to be filled. My curiosity led me, I'm going to create the jobs, and then I'm going to create the job that doesn't exist, and then I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell them what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to do it. And the beauty of that, there's no benchmark for, for, for the job that you create until you create that benchmark. Right, right, right. And, and that's, that, that's where it brought me into the Bloomberg environment where it's just started to grow like crazy and opportunities abounded. So I was never the type to sit around and wait for what needs to be done. I just went out and did whatever it is I felt felt was the best way to 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 help the company. Yeah, you know, being being curious, and I love that you said that because that's one of the most important attributes I'd say for myself. And I actually remember as a kid, my my cousin used to get annoyed because I used to ask so many questions because I was always so curious as a kid, <laughs> right. always just like that. And then the field that I'm in right now, and I would say like being curious equals knowledge building. Right. right? So when you're curious about something and you have a passion for something, as I do in in the investment world, right. That that's built my knowledge. So, and then when you build your knowledge, it builds confidence in the person that you're speaking to, that you want that person to become your client. And it really, at the end, and and that really what adds up to a very successful business. So, so really important for our audience to, to understand that. You have to be curious and you got to dig deep and be as micro as possible so you could be as you could be as knowledgeable as possible in your field. And I agree with that. And that's something Einstein always stood on and encouraging people in spite of his genius. The, the curiosity was a lot more valuable to him than just cramming, examining and regurgitating. But I teach college now and I teach at Columbia, Phil, and my students walk my, my students walk into my class and they look at me like I'm the man on the moon. Because they're expecting to walk in that I am going to just start talking to them for an hour and a half. I'm going to fill their mind with a bunch of knowledge. They're going to study it. They're going to cram, exam, and regurgitate. And their definition of success is if they get more than a 92 on that exam. So what do I do? I stop giving exams. They are a colossal waste of time. I have not given an exam in four years in my class. Why? I love that. (laughs) Well, I, I, when I tell you my professor, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, w- when I tell my students that they don't believe it, they all start looking around like, oh, my God, this guy is leading us into a trap. And they, they are honestly and I say that the body language is on display. They're skeptical and they're saying, OK, all right, we know there's no way he's leading us into a trap. And I tell them, one, if I give you an exam, I don't get to know you. You don't have a voice in an exam, but you can expect in this class, you will have a voice. We we are all each other's teachers. And my job is seeking first to understand how I can help you and then trying to be understood in what it is I can teach you. And what I teach is very much rooted on, on, on the personal development. Even though I teach in a program called Professional Development and Leadership, I teach engineers the art and science of communication, and I teach them emotional intelligence or the juxtaposition of the two. My engineering students, Phil, have been, have held, been held captive in college for four years in the cram exam regurgitate model. That's all they know. And my students from China and India, they're in class. The professor is the only one, the only voice in the room. Right. And when I call on them and I ask them, you know, give me your opinion of A, B, and C, they're terrified right, only right. because they're, they're, they're not conditioned to it. They're not conditioned to have a voice. And I think the, the curiosity and my father's voice is always in my head that we're in this together, that, 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 that I'm here to help you, 
but you need to meet me halfway here. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I, I I guess my own success in the chapter two of my career was just the humility to know that as the professor, I'm not the sage on the stage. I'm 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 just a mountain guide. I am here to help you find your way because your conventional education never cared about that. Well, I am here to completely flip your conventional education upside down because I was a product of it. And part of it was pretty good. Now, I'm not discounting the importance of, of many of the things I learned in my college experience. I just think it could have been a whole lot better. And, and I try to bring that with me to, to, to try to improve on the things that I thought college was deficient. Yeah, you know, Robert, Robin Sharma, he wrote a book about the, the man or the person that has no title, right? right. What's like right. What you're talking about because you're the professor and I'm the student and I'm looking at you like you're the professor right. and I'm the student. But yeah, you're treating it like I'm just a professor, but I'm not the professor. Let's all just be in the same page here. Let's learn. Yeah. Let's get better. Let's improve and grow. Yeah. You're a professor now at Columbia University, correct? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Like, yeah. In the Graduate School of Engineering. So, you know, to me, I'm a humble servant. I, I, I am grateful for the success that I had, which gives me the credibility. My teaching methods were such that they're completely crazy and unconventional. People call it my secret sauce. Wow. What is it that Chuck does? I don't do anything that's extraordinary. I just treat a class like a meeting. Yeah. Can you imagine, Phil, how many meetings have you been in when you're the only one that talked? Was that a good meeting? No. No. Oh, in, 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 in fact, I want 95% the client, 5% me. Indeed. It's the same thing in my classes, particularly when I'm teaching public speaking. My book, A Climb to the Top, because I'm, I'm a mountaineer, I've climbed mountains all over the world, and I use mountaineering as a metaphor for how to help people climb their careers. But the toolkit in my class are the communication techniques I outline in my book. And, and the advantage that I have is I can be incredibly creative in how I get my students to adopt those tools. So I, I say that because I am there to simply equip them with tools that I know work. What is it when an individual businessman or even you, I see you on LinkedIn now, I see your videos. It's wonderful to see that. You have a really good way about you. You have a nice style. It's approachable. People see it. You look good. And part of what I teach is that, is what do you say before your mouth even opens? That's a chapter on body language. So each of these different tools helps them to see themselves in their careers on a much more personal level, and then being able to use those tools to speak to you, to speak to their spouses, their children, their parents, and their boss, shareholders. It's all the same. We don't dissect the lessons learned in my class that this is just business. This is life. And that's the way that I approach it. So, Chuck, the top three tools that you teach that for my audience who's listening, mm -hmm. top three tools. Yeah. What, what is it? Yeah. It, it, the book has 10 chapters. And for context, it's called The Ten Commandments of Great Communicators. And if you watch Barack Obama, Martin Luther King, Winston Churchill, any of the great speakers, uh, it, this, this was a culmination of my own development of the years that I stood on stage. Let's go to the top three. The first one tool, and it's chapter one of the book, it's called the primacy recency effect. It's the observation that when you're speaking with someone, they are going to remember the first thing you said they will remember the last thing you said, the recency effect. So primacy, the first thing you said. Recency, the most recent. They will forget just about everything in between. Wow. They'll get the gist. Yeah, honest to God. They, 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 we in New York, Phil, speak at a rate of about 150 words a minute. Wow. That's a lot. California, the South, they tend to be a little slower because the culture speaks a bit slower, but it's still a lot to absorb. So the reason I say that, when you are speaking to someone, particularly in a formal presentation, be mindful of what people are going to remember, the first and the last. They won't remember much in between, but they will never forget how you made them feel. That's first. And, and also, I want to recognize before I get to the next two, communication has three dimensions to it. The visual, tonality, and the words. Visual is 55% of communication. That includes how you look, or you're in the tie, you've got a white shirt, you've got a slightly pink tie, you've got a blue suit. People see that. 
And I see that before you even spoke. It's 55% visual. You are communicating by your dress or your, your, the way you're dressed. The second is the tonality. I know what you said. I didn't like the way you said it. How I, often I, do we get with that with spouses? Yeah, I know what you said, but come on. You know, don't talk to me like that. People pick up on those cues and they don't like being spoke to that's condescending. And then the third is the words, which is only 7%. So 55% visual, 38% tonality, 7% words. That is, that is really interesting. I know. And, and, and it's really interesting when you, when you teach the Columbia engineers and you break down the math, this is the evidence that they need to understand, oh my God, this stuff is real. And, and in finance too, we're empirical people. We need evidence. You're an analyst. You need uh, to be able to put some math to it. So that's the first. The second thing I will say, and it, 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 if I had to write the book again, I might consider this to be chapter one. And it's called The Power of the Pause. Hmm. And I remember and in this chapter, I devoted the whole chapter to Mark Twain. And even though we never had a recording of Mark Twain, he was reputed to be the best public speaker in the history of the 18th or the 19th century. And, and one of the quotes he had is, the right word may be effective, but no word was ever as effective now notice my, my cadence here, as a rightly timed pause. By us speaking and pausing, strategically, consciously understanding I'm going to stop talking right now, I'm going to wait, because I need to maximize your absorption. I know you're not going to remember most of what I said. So the power of the pause, just like a good comedian who hits the punchline, it's all in the timing. You know, what's the deal with those peanuts on the airplane? You hear Seinfeld. His timing is impeccable because he controls it in such a way that you don't remember the setup. You remember the punchline. And so the pause is inserted to maximize absorption to the listener and to give the speaker the space in the pause to consider what's the next thing I'm going to say. I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a powerful one because so many people I work with at the executive level, particularly if I put them on camera or they're going to testify in front of Congress or whatever it is, they're all nervous about what they're going to say. I tell, Don't worry about that. You know more about your subject matter than any congressman, than anybody. You, you know 10 times more than the people who are asking you. So for you to be obsessed about what you're going to say, that's the last thing you should be considered. What you should be concerned with, how are you going to say it? Are you going to stay calm under the weight of enormous expectations? Are, are, is the vibe you're giving one of nerves or one of commanding in my presence? So school teaches us to pick the right words, but school does not teach us how to exercise those words in a way that people will best understand. So, yeah. Before you go, um, sorry, so Chuck, yeah. so incredible, right? And, I, and I've done hundreds of lectures throughout my career. And when I want yeah. to point across, I do always pause and I could see the audience then thinking about it. Right. The key thing is, is, like you just said, you know, it is it's about the articulation of what you're trying to say, how you say it. And that pause is so powerful. Now, let me ask you this. Words is 7%. Yep. Now, let's say I'm on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. I'm an email to a prospect. Mm -hmm. And I want to convey a certain message on that link on LinkedIn or, or, or prospect. Now, now, that's where words obviously do come in play. So what is your advice on? How can we kind of, you know, use the framework of, I mean, there's no visual to be used. There is yeah. a tonality. In, so what are your thoughts in terms of trying to convince somebody through LinkedIn or, or email to have a meeting with you? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a loaded question because it's, <laughs> yeah, we could spend a lot of time. Um, uh, but no, what, what I can say, sometimes when I see an email, and I think emails like the primacy recency effect, 
or you even think about, Phil, when you open up an email, in the first 250 milliseconds, you are making a judgment whether this is readable or not. Is it readable or deletable? And, and we're that fast in how, and, and it's no different than a first impression. Literally. You don't like this guy or hate this guy. Literally. You don't need, you don't need more than a split second to know that. I get a lot of emails, whether they're junk or whether they're good or bad, that are just volumes. Somebody is trying to prove to me that they're a subject matter expert by just bombarding me with all the things they know. Yeah. Chuck, if you consider this, if you consider that, if you consider that, and that doesn't work, how about this? And I said, oh my God, what can you get to it? We are, our, our attention spans have diminished. I, I don't think I'm, there's anyone that doesn't agree with me on that one. Twitter has not helped us. We, 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 we are so impetuous and impulsive and so fast that there's not a lot of depth to the way that we communicate or not as much as we used to. So on the email, if you're on LinkedIn, I, my, my only thing is, is the capturing of one message. Because I think most people complicate and, and, and they try to impress with volume and not with simplicity. Because if they're in simplicity, they're going to think people will think they're dumb and they don't know much. Simplicity and accessibility trumps volume every day of the week. People just don't want a lot of time. So I, I, I appreciate LinkedIn and I use it often as a tool and it's an effective one. I don't use LinkedIn if I'm trying to be persuasive necessarily. I'm just trying to capture or get them to capture my message. And then I'll follow up with an, with an email. And when I do have an email, I'll keep it very concise. And I'll, and, and I'll get to the third point. My third cha cha chapter in the book is called the rule of three. It's a Greek rhetorical technique. And Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he wrote it using the techniques of the rule of three. So think about us as Americans. We're born with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Abe Lincoln, when he wrote the Gettysburg Address, we cannot consecrate, we cannot desecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. Rule of three. Martin Luther King, when he wrote, I have a dream, he, he actually, he didn't, somebody else wrote it, but he used, I have a dream nine times. He did it in clusters of three. I have a dream that, I have a dream that. I have a dream that that's three. He went on to a bunch of other things and he came back to the three. The Greeks understood that the receiver of the information is very good at the rhythm of three. And you know, Michael Jackson sang, sang a song called ABC. It's one, two, three. It's easy as do, re, mi, ABC, one, two, three, baby, you and me, girl. Michael Jackson was the Beethoven of, 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 of me growing up. The guy was just awesome. He understood what people could absorb in his music. And when you think about Bach and Beethoven and the Beatles, beautiful the way that they wrote the music in ways that people could understand. And when I think about the rule of three, and you watch now, Phil, turn on your television, watch the Super Bowl, and look at the commercials commercials are generally in the rule of three. When you eat the Rice Krispies, snap, crackle, and pop. I came, I saw, I conquered. There's all kinds of examples of that. Yeah, there because, is. Right, and it's a rhythm that we as the listeners fall into other people's rhythms. Right. Right. So that's the way I speak, but I also teach people to do that. And to many, Phil, it blows their mind. Oh my God, I never thought of that. Well, nobody taught you. That. It's okay. You weren't taught that. I don't know why. If I could like rewind my entire education, I would put all of this in elementary education. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, this and fine, and I'll be the finance guy in that. <laughs> all right. Thank you. That's one of the parts that's lacking. But if you really think about it, these things that you're teaching me right now, and and your clients, and if we just read your book, I mean, how amazing would that be? If we learned at an elementary school, plus learned about finance, compound of interest and saving right. money, right, which is such important fundamentals of, of, of managing money. I mean, how incredible. And how, I just don't understand how it's not a curriculum in school. I um, learned, you said it before. You said it before that under Bloomberg, and I want to talk about that next, under Mike Bloomberg, you learned so much from him, more than your education, et cetera. I mean, the same thing with me, being in business and, and having mentors. I've learned much more from them than all the hours I put into schools. Go, go well, there, there, there's something I learned, and I don't know if this is specific to Mike Bloomberg, but Mike's past was he was a trader. And 
uh, he was much more than that. But as a trader, what you know, what you learn about is something we call execution. You have Google, it's at 120. You decide it's 121. You don't have to decide. You don't partially decide. You decide to sell it. There, there's, it's, it's binary. There's, there's no yes or no. You just right. sell. So you learn execution. Um, what school does, school promotes getting a 92. There's no execution. School promotes Give me good thoughts. That's good. And sometimes creativity. I'm, I'm not bashing the educational model, but what it doesn't teach you is the importance of execution and don't let trying to be perfect be the enemy of the very good. I have a lot of students. They, they don't do much because they're so locked in on being perfect. They exhaust themselves on the journey to get there. And what I learned from Mike is is execute. And if you don't get it exactly right, adjust. It was constantly in my head. Execute and adjust. Execute and adjust all the time. Don't try to be perfect. Strive for progress. And he was so supportive of that culture because we were a small company trying to figure it, figure it out. There were no employee manuals. There were no learning streams. It was just us trying to sell this thing called the Bloomberg Terminal that nobody ever heard of. So when you have the luxury of being in that kind of company that encourages you, stop trying to be perfect. In fact, you would be, you would be dismissed or even forgotten about if you tried to be perfect. Don't intellectualize. Don't complicate. Keep it simple. Decide. Execute. Adapt. Adjust. Whatever adjective you're, whatever verb you want to describe to it. School did not promote or teach me about this thing that we call an execution quotient because right, right. that's a decision-making model. It's measurable. You know what you did. It's a commitment and other people follow your example. So I learned from Bloomberg in the first couple of weeks where decisions were constantly being made. I didn't sit around thinking about, oh my God, am I going to get this wrong? I was encouraged to get it partially right and then to work on it. That is a beautiful thing to be in that environment because a lot of environments aren't like that. Yeah, you know, I love that you pointed this out because what I've noticed, you know, with some of my team members is they overanalyze, overanalyze, overanalyze. Mm -hmm. and, and that's good. But if you overanalyze, it's like analysis process. You'll just never get anything done. Right. So like, you know, so, so people, and this is a really important point, Chuck, that people really have to understand. Like everybody wants to go out there being perfect. And when you do that, you just don't, you like a deer in the headlights, you don't even move, right? Again, you have to be smart, obviously, right? Simplify it, take your time thinking about it. But if you overanalyze, it'll be, you'll, you'll have a difficult time, you know, getting off the ground. So I really appreciate that. And I found myself is I want to have what's called this perfect day, right? I want to, from 7.30 a.m. until 9 a.m., do a reading and 9 to 10, call clients, and, and then this whole day laid out. And I've been doing that for the past 20 years and I still can't figure it out. <laughs> right. It's a work in progress. Why is that? It's like, I want this perfect day. And why is it that people like trying to plan these perfect days and have a hard time actually doing that verbatim every single day? Yeah, this is a tough one. This gets to the whole heart of human psychology, which I do teach. And, and I, I teach out of a book that Dale Carnegie wrote in 1936 called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, that, was my, that was my career Bible. But what, 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 what one of the chapters talks about is we as human beings are amazing self-protection mechanisms. We are always trying to protect the thing that, that keeps us comfortable. And that if you are committed, and, and, and what I always think about, am I more committed to my dreams than I am to my comfort zone. And what happens, what you're describing is we are always reverting to the mean of what is our default behavior because it's what we're used to and it's what we're comfortable. Any attempt to try to break out of the thing that, that, that brings you into that psychologically safe place is uncomfortable. And I would imagine, Phil, on some days you have more courage for discomfort than other days. I, don't, I think that's just in the stars. But I think that's most of us we grapple with. We, we bring this unconscious bias that safety is the most important thing. And, and it's good. I, I, I don't diminish the importance of that. But 
when you are psychologically safe and if you're trying too hard to protect the safety of this habit forming, you don't get out of those habits. You just start forming bad habits. So I think it's something that I encourage. And I think the advantages I have because I teach so much public speaking, you get to make it up and you get to do it different ways. And there's no one right way to give a speech. There's no one right way to hold a meeting. But I am vigilant about trying to bring a variety of different tools and changing them all the time so that you're not locked into that same habits that you get into that I think can be self-destructive because you are what you habitually do. And what I don't think the educational model does is help us to consider or introspect on our habits and how could we do it better. Right. Right. I agree with that. Discomfort. I want to, I want to segue into that because I was going to ask you this. So yeah. when I was getting ready to launch my own firm and I was at UBS right. for about two years within the firm, I was thinking about how we're going to do this. And as I started to move forward with the idea, there were, there were times, Chuck, that I felt like when I ran a marathon, like I hit a wall. Like, yeah. This is people. Then I, but then I just pushed through that. I'm like, and just the way I was built and just various people that I've, you know, um, mentored in the past, I just pushed through that discomfort. Then I got to that next level and then I felt it again and I pushed through and then eventually I, then that, then I am where I am at today. Yeah. So there are these moments that we all have in our lives where you, you get that, this, this uncomfortable feeling. And I feel like that uncomfortable feeling for some, they don't know how to get by that. And that's why they kind of stay where they are. No question. Or maybe even digress, right. Or maybe even digress. Yeah. So Talk to me about this discomfort feeling that I'm telling you about. Yeah. And some of the most successful people in the world today, like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, I'm assuming they get that feeling, but keep pushing. What is your view of this discomfort feeling? And what can you tell people to help them push through that? Yeah, no, you are spot on. In fact, I think if we think about in our own lives, as we are raised, we ascend in our careers, nobody talks about this. They talk about technical proficiency. But what I recognize is your technical proficiency will get you halfway up a career mountain. With Bezos and Musk, they're technically proficient. They always have been. Their secret sauce has nothing to do with technical competence. What you're describing, and I often think about in so many of the books that I've read over the years, the, the self-help industry, you should probably, if you're not invested in it, I hope you are. But my God, they must sell billions of dollars worth of books. It changed my life. There's no doubt about it. I would not be where I'm at today if it wasn't for No question. No question. Same with me. And, I, and there are a few career Bibles of how to win friends and influence people, how to master the art of selling by Tom Hopkins, and, and many more. There, there are a lot of good ones out there. But Phil, I think about there's one book that has had a, 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 a really profound effect on me, and it may surprise you. And this is what I encourage people to think about. To start to see things in a different way is there's this wonderful book written in the late 19th century called Alice in Wonderland. And Alice is bumbling around, and she sees a rabbit, and she follows the rabbit, and she falls down a hole. And as she falls down the hole, she recognizes, oh, my God, uh, how am I going to get out of this? I think everybody should fall, follow the rabbit. Now that's your curiosity. Follow that rabbit, fall down the hole. Because what Alice had to recognize as she was falling down the hole, she did not have a choice. She had to find a way out. I think most people don't follow their curiosity, don't fall down the rabbit hole, and don't find a way out as to what you described in your evolution from UBS to Palumbo Wealth. You could have, if you didn't have the discomfort, you'd still be there. Yes. But you made the decision to, to get comfortable in the discomfort of falling through that rabbit hole, recognizing the risk that would come that you have to find your way. Palumbo Wealth Management did not exist. There was no entity. You, what's the old expression in, in Alice in Wonderland? If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. You had to decide on the road that's going to get you. But the challenge, Phil, that road didn't exist. There was no paved arrow to take you. Hey, there's Palumbo Wealth Management. I think I can find my own firm. Well, what do we do in college? We look at the job ads and then we go follow the paths. Okay, that's a good place to start, but it's a very comfortable thing because I get to react to what the world is telling me. Right. 
what you're describing, what Bezos and Musk have done, and I've done it in a small scale. I said, yeah, okay, we've all worked for these other companies. We're going to fall through our rabbit hole. We're going to find a way out. And when we get out of that rabbit hole, it's not like anything that ever existed. Oh, climb, oh. climb leadership never existed. I'd never written a book. I'd never taught at Columbia. I'd never climbed a mountain. I'd never done a radio show. Now I'm doing TV. I'd never done a TV show. Think about all these things. Now for you, think about that rabbit hole you fell in and think about coming out of that rabbit hole. Now you created the thing that didn't exist because you said, what the hell? Let me fall. Let me get uncomfortable. And sometimes it's a thunderdome. You know, you're on the train heading home. Am I doing the right thing? Oh my God. You're so busy self-protecting in fact, I think it was Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He said, when you're leading change, most people, Phil, are more concerned about what they're going to give up than what they stand to gain. Think about the enormity of that statement. If you're, right, you're going through your change model, and if all you're concerned about, what am I going to give up? The big UBS job, all the benefits, you know, the big skyscrapers, you're going to give that up. Yeah. Why? Most of the people say, you're crazy. Why would you give that up? Because it's not feeling right to you. Totally. I was just going to, I was just going to say, uh, I don't mean to interject. Yeah. As we're talking through this, the uncomfortable feeling that I felt a couple of times before preparing to then launch my own firm. Right. What got me through that, like you explained before, what got me through that was such a belief of this model is the right model for my clients. I'm not just saying that on this show with you just to say it sounds like a, you know the right thing to say. It, it truly generally is. I felt so strongly about it. And that was enough to get me through that then to eventually launch my firm. So it's, so it's an inner passion and belief. And I really do believe like Elon Musk and Be Bezos had the same feeling for what they did or else they would never have done that. So it's almost like to get through as again, just as we're talking through this, to get through that discomfort has a lot to do with your belief and passion. That's what's going to get you through that. If you don't really believe in that passion about you making that stance and whatever it is that you want to do, you're not, you're probably not going to break through that barrier. Look at the key words, Phil, that you're using. And to our listeners, I want you to, get to, to listen to what Phil was saying. The key words that you were using, felt, feel, believe, faith. Where in school did we learn any of that? Oh, my gosh. None. How we felt, nobody cared how we felt. They cared that you got a 95 and you got admitted to an Ivy League. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a very good thing. I wasn't a product of the Ivy League. I, I, I what it, it, it didn't matter. I know how I felt all along the road in my career that nobody could define for you. You couldn't put a grade on it. You couldn't put a, a monetary value on it. We as human beings, we feel first, we think second. There's a hierarchy. We wake up every day. I'm not asking you what you think. I'm asking you how you feel. And what you talked about in your transition from UBS to Palumbo, it's how I felt. Oh. And, and even, even to me, when I was at Citadel and I left to find, to, 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 to find climb leadership, it was all a feeling. Nobody was telling me, hey, Chuck, start climb leadership. You can do this and you can do that. I had to make it up. But it's because I, I, I wasn't feeling right. I was feeling uneasy. I didn't want to do this anymore. And here I was in this huge job, an MD at this wonderful hedge fund, making more money than I could ever count. I, and I didn't want to do it anymore. And people said, what are you, nuts? No, I'm not nuts. I just don't feel like it. It doesn't feel right. I want to do my thing. So what you're describing, Phil, I wish more people in the world would believe in themselves and to take the leap, but often they don't because they're held captive by their biases of protection. And they're too concerned about what am I going to give up as opposed to what do I stand to gain? And they have this, and they have this voice in their head of something that maybe their parents told them, don't take risks yes. or, you know, other family member or friend or whatever it may be. And that's oftentimes what, what, what you know, keeps people back. Uh, agreed. Oftentimes we are our own worst enemies. We, we are held back by the voices in our head. Also, I will say to some people, sadly, 
they're really caught up into other people's opinions of them. And, and I get it. There's just a lot of social judgment. I've never been one to give a damn what anyone thought of me. I, I, I was, ne- I don't care. I, I, I'd be a good guy and, and, you know, you establish a reputation, but many people are so concerned and I'm going to, I'm going to take a shot at social media for this. They're, they're, they're busy looking at the conformity of the rest of the world. And do I fit in? And I understand that people want to belong. But I think for you, me, we set an example when we, when we leave those big machines and we decide to, to go our own way, I think we're leading a generation in, in a small way, but I think in an impactful way to give them the confidence to be able to do it themselves. Because I think we're living proof that you can do that and, and feel good about it. And not only do it, I really feel like if you really want to get ahead in life, having your own business, being an entrepreneur... It gives you the unlimited capacity to do whatever you want to do. It's just, it changes the energy in your body and your soul. And, and it's, I really genuinely feel there is no other way to really get ahead in, you know, in life. Of course, you could have success at these corporations. I'm not saying that, but I really, I really, really do feel that. Chuck, I just want to transition to Michael Bloomberg. So you worked yeah. on Michael Bloomberg. Yeah. Top three things you learned from him. You gave us one already. Yeah. Which was yeah. brilliant. Yeah, I, I'd say num- n- number the second one is the, the be be boldly reliable, and by that I mean always be someone that can be counted on to do what they say they're going to do. And with Mike, it was the alignment of the, your actions in your words. In order to do well in that organization, you had to build. It's called the CTR factor. That's not his invention, but that's what I lived at Mike, Mike's place. CTR, build your credibility, you earn trust, and then that's how you get respect. But you only do that because you're someone that other people can count on. Not to be perfect, but you can count on that person to do what they said they're going to do. And then the third one, I, I, I think with Mike, and I saw him, don't be afraid to make mistakes be afraid of not learning from them. I appreciate in that organization, if you were willing to take risks, not recklessness, but if you were willing to take measured risks and to be bold in your assertion, but recognize that you're going to make, you're going to get a lot of things wrong before you get a few things right. And I think the scientists know that in their experimentation. And Mike was an engineer. He was really supportive of that. Try A. My A didn't work. What are you going to do? Change your mind. Try B. Oh, yeah, it didn't work. Sooner or later, you might give up on something. But what an encouragement it was to have someone that said, let's try it and see how it goes. And if, it's, if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. Th- those were lessons that... I wish when I walked into a college class and they were drilling formulas into my head and then I went home and I had to memorize the formulas for statistics class and I forgot all of them by Monday. I wish class had been more like that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and Mike taught me that in the first couple of weeks where I said, this is the best education I've ever had. Uh, and, And the funny thing is I paid a lot of money to go to college. I was getting paid to learn from him. That's when it, it hit me, Phil. There's something wrong in this whole model. <laughs> right? I like getting paid to learn from this guy. Yeah. I didn't like paying. I, you know, I cut grass, sold Italian ices, flipped hamburgers, <laughs> you know, sold pizza, washed cars, all to earn money to go to college to memorize formulas that I have completely forgotten a week later. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of it was good. I'm not bashing it. I just, I, I'm, I'm just stymied at what I see in my college students, and I'm not faulting anyone. I just think the model is right for adjustment when you and I are around these extraordinary leaders that teach us these things. And I look back at the gap between what I thought I knew and what I came to learn. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, maybe, maybe it's meant to be this way and I'm glad it is. It's worked out well for us, but <laughs> maybe maybe it could maybe it could have been another way to get here. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, Chuck, as far as you working with several leaders, Michael being one of them and others, you coach, et cetera, as far as day-to-day habits, what have you learned? What day-to-day habits have you learned from them 
that you feel is impactful to having a very productive day from yeah. the moment you wake up until the moment you go to bed? Yeah, I think the development of those habits are even from the moment we wake up, I, I am blessed to be an early riser. I had a paper out when I was nine years old and, and I used to get up at six and I, I've never stopped that habit. So, uh, and, and what I found even at Bloomberg, he was always the first guy in the office. It wasn't always, and it wasn't about FaceTime. It was just about the habits of you start your day, you know, your, your best, your, your best production is the first three hours of your day. And, Right. It has to be because you got a lot of energy, you had a cup of coffee, you got a lot of juice, but you got the mindset. But I think the, the most important part is every day is achieved, not in these bold, big moves. It's in these little things that guide us along the way that people notice. So, so I know when I got to the office, you know, whatever, whether it's Bloomberg or BlackRock, the most important thing that I could do was to collaborate with my mates for those that I needed to, to help me and those that I could be of help to. So what, what I recognized early on, the more generous I was with my time toward others, the more generous they were to me. And I learned this reciprocity law that, that the careers that were being made is because people got behind you and they supported you because you got behind them and you supported them. So my habits were very much throughout the course of a day, checking in with the mates that mattered to me. Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help you? Okay. If not, can I ask you to help me with, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you assist? Just the acts of the communication and the collaboration, because I know on any given day, if the day was going to be a good one, it's not because I did something. It's because of the multiplier effect that whatever it is I did trickled down to other people. Right. And, and I think that, that, that that's this. Nobody talks about it. But I know my best days when I left Park Avenue and headed to Grand Central and I recount my best days how blessed I was to be at the table with very smart, capable people that wanted to be at the table with me. Because you can take a, a dumb idea and put some really good people in a room and it will turn into a great idea. Great. And, and I think what we can do to serve to our listeners, be communicative, be collaborative, and be emotionally intelligent. And, and I, 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 I can't emphasize that enough. And by that, I mean, be aware of how other people are behaving. Understand that some days they have bad days and there are times that you will learn to, to move in and to back off. Right. And, and I teach emotional intelligence. I learned it in grad school and it, it, it was like, like rocket red glare when I started to learn. I was like, oh my God, I never learned this stuff. I had to learn how to read a room. I had to see what's the vibe and the dynamic. Why are people not moving on this? What are they afraid of? How do we remove the fears? Most of what I detected, Phil, was not something that was stated verbally. I came to learn people's reactions in the body language and what they didn't say. You learn more from your colleagues from what they don't say because everybody buttons up. They're very careful and protective. Right. So, right. So each day from the time you come in to the time you leave, be open, transparent, and helpful. And if you can do that and never be a jerk, mm -hmm. you're a jerk once. It's over. It's over. Right. So Chuck, to transition to money management and philosophy, right? Whether you're working with a manage, wealth manager you believe in, what he or she is oh. to you and your own self. What yeah. is your belief around money management and investing and financial planning? Just your yeah. personal opinion, something, whatever it may be, whatever. Yeah. Not, put it well, out. I, I think I'll start with something I see often when I see on the television commercials where somebody starts telling you what you should do with your money. I don't know that individual. I've never met him. Susie Orman. I'm not knocking her. She's just someone that comes on and says, you need to do this. There's something in money management that, I, that people who are about to give you their money recognize there's no way you can predict what the risk tolerance is. Yeah. You don't know. And I think when I started getting into the business, people ask, oh, you got a good tip. Well, I can't give you a tip because I don't know what it is you're willing to accept. Right. I could go to Las Vegas, turn the wheel, put all my money on black. You want? I could do that for you. And if you want me to do that, I could make you a million bucks or I could lo lose you a million bucks. But I think the main thing is 
The good money manager takes the time and, and, and it's a long slog to get your clients comfortable in the discomfort of getting them to speak to you about their risk tolerance. And I mean that honest to God. I don't think they're coming to you, although they may, you know, to call me when I'm rich. In fact, they're, they're more concerned about protecting what they have than about what it is that you could potentially make for them. So the good money manager to me is always transparent, open, communicative, constantly, whether it's a rebalance every quarter, you're checking in to see how your client feels about what you're doing. Are we living up to expectations? And it's not just about the Dow was up 12 and we were up 13. I think if the Dow was up 12 and you're up 13 and your competitor was up 14, they're going to stay with you if they like you more. I don't think for that incremental difference, because people want to feel the comfort level with their money manager. Don't have to be perfect, but you got to be good enough. And by good enough is you got to treat them like they're human beings, not like they're a machine. And I think that's what I like about what you do for a business, because we could go to Vanguard and just stick it in the index fund, but I got no one to talk to if I did that. And I really need, we're, we're, we're social creatures when it comes to our money. We need to feel like somebody's looking out for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, money, you know, I always tell people, it's like a three-legged stool, right? The first step is you're healthy. If you're healthy, you, you can, in second legged stool is your, your family. If you're healthy, you can enjoy your family. And to enjoy your family, you do need a couple of dollars, right? So the one thing yeah. people do is they love, their, people, what one thing people love is their lifestyle. People love their lifestyle. They want to be able to maintain that lifestyle. So right. protection of capital, you said it perfectly. It's what added out the past 21 years of doing this. It's that protection of capital that's so important, especially in the environment that we're in today. Right. And the clients see what I have done for them in this type of environment and protecting versus what the market is doing. That's really important. And the upside, like you said, and there's, it may not be the exact upside, but that's okay. It's about protecting your capital. Um, I would imagine even now, Phil, you know, you must be, and I've heard from my money manager, you're, 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 you're checking in on, on, on these, you know, we're at war. There's no good news. You know, there, there's no good news coming out of the world right now. So you're, you're constantly communicating. Uh, hey, I'm with you. We feel your pain. Gas is at six bucks. A cup of coffee is four bucks. I get it. It's really expensive. Here's what we're doing as in, in response to that. Yes, absolutely. Communication in these types of situations are extremely important. And not only that, but then also being straight with people. Like I really genuinely believe things are going to get worse here before it gets better. So psychologically, I'm preparing for that, right? I'm not saying, hey, this is the bottom. We're straight yeah. up here. I genuinely believe like just psychologically, mentally, just be prepared. Here's what's going on. Here's what I've done and things like that. And yeah. then and move forward. So, so Chuck, yeah, yeah. it's really been amazing. And no, pleasure, Phil. I want, I, want, I want to send this to my clients so they could share this with their children and grandchildren because there are yeah. incredible life lessons here that okay. everybody should learn, especially at a younger age. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. I really appreciate it. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be on your show, Phil. Thank you. All right, Chuck. Thank you.